uh, <clears throat> so this is me. Um, market research is not the word I would use for where I'm coming from. Um, I have been working with applying behavioral science, which is understanding human decision making um, for about over 12 years now in different contexts, right? So um, what we do in that is we go study human decision making in multiple contexts. It could be why are people throwing waste? Why are people not wearing masks? Why are people not buying, right? Like uh, why are people not investing in mutual funds? So you go figure out why that's I happening, a research on the audition making through a certain process and kind of provide interventions and solutions, right? And these interventions are usually design based. Um, so that's why some of us call ourselves behavioral designers as well. Um, five years ago, I started being an independent consultant and last year I established in so many words, um, which is that consulting on uh, social behavior change. I also have a second business, which is Vaisa. Vaisa in Tamil means age, my mother tongue, uh, where it's a safe space for uh, community members to age, um, you know, uh, adults and uh, adults and wisdom generation to age and talk about aging and also get connected with other um, service providers in the aging ecosystem. Um, that's me. Today, what we are gonna do is like, um, like uh, what um, Ruchi has mentioned, I have been in Hen for, um, it's going to be a year this June. Um, and I noticed that there are a lot of, a uh, lot of us who have, who come from this background of either we are selling products, we are running a community um, or, or we, are, we are providing a service uh, through brands and everything, uh, brand consulting and everything. And we all deal with clients and customers and community members. And I have been doing behavioral science workshops on different contexts. And I thought this is a space where I can uh, spark some thoughts uh, based on which you can uh, go about, um, you know, like working with human behaviors in your context, right? Because ultimately all of us are working with human behaviors everywhere. Um, so today, these are the different queries. Like I had asked in the form, what are the behavioral uh, challenges you are facing? And these are the different um, problems that many of you have responded with and I've just clubbed them into different aspects, right? One is either they are not committing, like I have an insurance product they are taking from us and they are not renewing it or they don't want to commit to buying a subscription or things like that, right? Or you send them certain links and they are not clicking on the link, but they're doing some other actions. So there are attrition that's happening. And also this huge thing around willingness to pay. There is, there is a need both you realize and the uh, customer realizes, but there is a friction when it comes to willingness to pay. And there are trust issues. Uh, and also one of them mentioned around self-management and, you know, uh, you know, I, it, in the creative field, how it's always about, I have to commit to the, it becomes very burdensome, right? Everything is urgent. So these are the different things we are going to cover. What I will be providing you with in the uh, next few minutes is, just give you um, some un some basic structure. This is uh, usually these workshops I take across, preferably across four to five days, two to three hours each day, uh, because it takes so much time to process human behavior and apply your learnings within the workshop, right? Otherwise, it, it's, it's, it will just look like a gyan because everyone is working with human behaviors. Everyone thinks that we all know human behaviors. And so, um, unless and until we really go through it, process it and apply it, it's it's difficult to really immerse yourself with the decision making process. But in this, considering it's just one and a half hours, um, I will be sharing a certain kind of thought structure or a model that you can take forward with when you deal with human behaviors, right? Your customer behaviors rather. So the agenda is gonna be first, we'll quickly get into how we decide and then we'll uh, jump into what is really working with this decision making process, what is really working as an intervention and I've, as much as possible, I've tried to get examples to the problems that you guys have posted. And also quickly, I wanna do one touch on if you are now understanding behaviors and trying to change behaviors of your customers, how should you look at yourself? 
because we are also humans we are making the same errors our customers are making right then how can we look at ourselves so that we make a ethical model and a good uh, behavior change agent right so are you guys um, are you guys able to hear me is is this uh, working just a quick check in yeah yeah we can we can hear you we can understand so far all good awesome okay um cool so the first thing is how we decide when we think about decision making what part of your body comes to your mind immediately heart heart okay brain brain cool anyone else people are writing in chat harsha says oh. heart sorry then harsha says head, head. she is confused <laughs> yeah we all say heart and head because we connect emotions with heart and then like logic with head but everything happens in the head our brain is our decision making organ um uh, the brain is the what is controlling our entire movement body everything right it's our control center okay uh, the default state of our brain it is like as as early as august last year it was found that the default state of a brain you are sitting you have nothing to do you're just like looking blank you're doing nothing the default state is of your brain then is also meandering thoughts thoughts are constantly running in our brain and what are they trying to do we are getting signals from our skin from our hands from our eyes all our senses are giving us signals um are giving us inputs to our brain all the signals are giving and whatever information we are reading even when you're not doing anything else your other sensorial organs are taking in information and even without that information your brain has a storage of a lot of information and all it's trying to do with those thoughts is making sense of everything that you already know okay so but in this in this meandering thoughts is where something will grab your attention okay i have committed to come to this zoom meeting so i am here and my attention is on on this meeting right so that stimuli of your commitment and this entire experience being in front of you is grabbing your attention and now your new thoughts are going into your brain as you are learning right so why is why is thought why are thoughts constantly trying to make sense because ultimately our brain is a learning machine okay our ultimate the brain's ultimate goal is to learn and evolve that's all we are doing right even in our mistakes that's why all our mistakes are learning even our successes are a learning because then we know that what ingredients made this success and we know what ingredients made this loss okay so that's what our brain is simple movements these are also coming out of our brain our heart is just making us with whatever we know until now about our body our heart is just pumping blood and making the operation happen but our brain is the control center right the whole uh, idea that i just want to mention this i mentioned this everywhere Uh, is the idea of there is a left brain right brain is super debunked our brain is one whole system it works together so in fact if you are right handed go and start learning left hand it's absolutely fine which means you are making those neural connections of your left hand now activated and new neural connections are happening in your brain and that's good for your decision making right so just that in this another thing about the brain i'm going to quickly just give you some uh, some information around this because again human behaviors are very fascinating and these are the building blocks to understand that human behavior one of the ways our brain has so many millions of con connections right every day that number just goes uh, keeps growing and and ultimately how is it trying to process so many information make so many decisions in a day is because over 90% of our decision making is non conscious the mere fact that i'm moving my hand is a very non conscious decision that's also a decision it's a very non conscious decision i'm making what words are coming next and after is very non conscious i'm not thinking should i put is what whatever i'm not thinking or like that even customers com com community members all of us decide in many situations we decide non consciously and that's that's the we are brain tries to be efficient right because the if we put thought and conscious uh, thinking into every simple decision and action we take it will overload our brain so it's a machine that's trying to be efficient by once you have learned something new and it becomes natural in your response uh, it puts it back and say okay we can non consciously do this right so for example learning from cultures 
um, let's say your parents have always just invested in FD and they have never invested in mutual funds. And throughout your childhood, you have learned that FD is the safest bet and, and uh, you know, mutual funds are like, you know, risky. If you keep learning that you're being conditioned, your, your brain is being conditioned and non-consciously when you grow up also, your first option would be FD. Right, because you're conditioned in the brain's efficient way of decision. There is, I have to save. Let me do FD because I know that cultural learning is conditioned as a non-conscious thing, right? Decision making. So, um, like I said, it's trying to operate efficiently, but that does not mean that the brain is perfect. That's why we are human. We are is is a is a problem because the brain is not perfect. We make it's extremely erroneous we make a lot of uh, flaws in our judgment, right? Um, that, that flaws in judgment is called is what is called bias. For example, our parents have taught us that FD is safe, mutual fund is risk, better not do the risk. That's a flaw in judgment. You, there, there is nothing else that has told that person that, hey, um, uh, hey probably I, I, I should find for myself whether uh, mutual funds are risky or less risky. I should find for myself whether like, you know, mutual funds uh, can probably give me more returns, right? That flaw in judgment happens and that's what is called bias. And that's how we, we kind of say these, I, these beliefs and mental models that we have, right? Only certain type of people spit or India is always littered or India is always dirty, you know? Uh, those kind of things are judgments that we gain through uh, other learnings, other places where we learn. Uh, one important thing I do want to mention when we think about judgments, because your customer every step of the way is judging your product, is judging what you're providing, is judging your communication with them. And it's very important to know for yourself where their judgment might be going wrong or is going wrong and kind of address that judgment, right? Now, uh, your customer is not going to judge or assume things that they don't know of. They are going to make judgments only based on what they know and most likely what they know is very less right someone had mentioned that hey people don't know that um, either plant-based or organic skincare products are heavier in price they are not understanding it it's probably because their larger field of understanding about skincare products is the, is the lesser costs they don't know that this has more effort and so this has to cost more right so so they are making a judgment based on what they know okay and it's not just them, it's also us, right? And humans don't judge based on what, what we don't see, feel, or hear, even though we say e-commerce is best and everything. Uh, okay, e-commerce is just using our visual senses. It's using trust and reviews and everything. But if we have, let's say, an experience center where you can go and experience the product, what is happening to the brain is all our other haptic senses are also feeding in information to our brain. Oh, this is good. This feels rusty. This feels this. all that information together will work together to make a decision. Right. So uh, we don't judge or assume what we don't feel. So you think you may feel something based on seeing, uh, based on your product, but the customer should also feel the same for them to be able to not get biased. Okay. Finally, how we all judge is we judge very, very, very self-protectively. And this is very important, especially in financial products or in financial contexts also, right? People are not subscribing. People are not paying. People are not renewing is because they're trying to be self-protective. And that's also coming from a bias in their judgment, which is um, they are loss averse, right? I feel that this is loss or they are not thinking long-term. Uh, I feel that this is not needed to, for me right now. You know, these are what is happening and that's their way of protecting themselves, their financial status and their needs and their time, their cognitive load, right? Ultimately, we are all animals. Humans are all animals. We are not superior to animals. Um, in fact, the brain of a ki human kid, brain of a, any other animal like a cat is probably similar because uh, that's all the brain has developed at that time. We are all animals. Ultimately, we have this instinct to protect ourselves. And for humans, unlike the wild where your self-protection kicks in only when you are going to get eaten or when there's a threat to your life, for humans, um, beyond threat to our life, we perceive threats in, in financial threats. We perceive uh, general th threats of just getting harm. We perceive threats because of whether we perceive threats because of oh, someone would humiliate me. So these are all situations where we go into self-protection mode and make a judgment. 
following until now any questions okay no nope. okay cool uh, so in with the, we know that the brain is our control center we know that the brain is not perfect and we do make errors in our judgments now in this how are our products our marketing communication um uh, any any kind of information how are we making how do we understand our needs you know our personal needs and even seek a product for example right how are we doing that for that i want to just run you through uh, sorry this is just a small gif so sorry when you see this gif of um you know of of uh, of a uh, seed germinating and becoming a plant through the soil what do you perceive guys you all can unmute yourself and shout out if your cameras are on so shweta writes growth, growth. someone says growth yes as you are growing new connections are forming yes that's a part of it yes anything else that comes to your mind as the leaves were growing it made space for itself for a while and i was not able to see the end of it but i think it got damaged also because there was not enough space after a while and the other one was fighting too probably <laughs> okay uh, what do you think about the soil itself <laughs> I it also depends soil. on the foundation. The foundation, the soil, uh, plays also plays a very important role, right? So, however, we are laying it. Whatever uh, we are showing the customer also makes a lot of difference. That needs to be strong. That's so, how your yeah. plant will grow. Yes, that that's kind of the line of thinking, right? What is the soil providing? Is if the soil is not in good condition, the seed will not germinate. Forget growing. Correct. So. the context of that soil it should have the right amount of nutrients it should have the right amount of like coarse and fine texture it should have the right space like someone mentioned for in, for anything to grow make a good you know in this in our case make good decisions but in the plants case just grow right so yes similarly for our brain also context is the ruler okay uh you as your with your marketing products with your uh, uh, constant you know human connection with your community members what you are doing is you are seeding information into the customers context okay so most of your how you approach behavior is how you seed those information when you seed those information where you seed those information right so uh, that's all it is we are all making decisions based on our context there are two types of contexts in this there is both our internal and our external context our internal context are our identity which is very important which most of the time we forget to or fail to give importance to every communication we make should uh, the more and more projects i am doing in fact uh, identity is coming out as a, uh, as a as a biggest uh, uh, point even in our in our own behavior science research people miss out on identity but identity is such a core to us and we are all becoming it could be individual identity or community identity it doesn't matter whether you are an individual society or collectivistic right but that identity that you hold has a very big importance in in how you uh, how you uh, make uh, make a decision and there are also your external context right your external motivation what are other people doing your culture norms all of that uh, they all feed into your judgments your beliefs uh, they all you know bring bring out your beliefs your create mental models the mere of model that okay um, uh let's say plant based skin care products are good for health is a mental model that's coming from the different context and information that that has been fed to you around it right uh, it could also be coming from your own experience you have you have experienced like products that have chemicals and that's not working on you and one day you did this and it it clicked right so all of that is kind of feeding into your beliefs and mental models and one another thing you need to like how context is the ruler there is also another thing which is emotion we are not logical beings okay we learn logic our brain learns to make logical decision making hey there is hen community 
and i know i need a community but i need to be able to invest in hen and take advantage of it right that's a logical decision making but if i just like my my need is so desperate and i just like don't even think about the money also because i can afford it uh, and then i just buy it that's just emotional decision making right there's no logic there you have not really assessed whether this is what you need do you need a different community do you need some other kind of support maybe not a community those kind of things are all logical thinking and usually we uh, we learn that logical thinking from through as we are growing and everything but our emotions drive our decision making right um, that's why i said the, if you're also more self aware if your customer is more self aware they know why they are investing a high amount in a something why they choose to invest a low amount in something uh, and that way their emotion also gets uh, regulated again right so this is a very simple decision making framework your internal and external context influences your beliefs and mental models your judge judgments come in the way along uh, and also keeps getting updated they all feed to create a certain emotion this is not as linear as i'm saying but it's just to simply to understand and if you are a self aware person if your customers are self aware or if you take steps towards making them self aware there is more chances that uh, they will regulate their emotion uh, instead of feeling loss at do as pay at, at paying they will probably realize that no no my need is important i need this support system right they'll find their own reason as to why they are paying and that will give them in fact more satisfactory emotion that will lead to either desire or intent or action and if the outcome is favorable it's most likely that your behavior will sustain any doubts on this questions are coming but i'm hoping you're taking questions at the end yeah yeah um okay cool uh, i just want to quickly also run you through the awareness bit of it uh, just to seed this thought there are different types of self awareness many of you you and your customers are many of us are just seekers they don't i mean in the sense like in many contexts right we we deal with many contexts we know who we are let's say sexually we know who you who we are let's say professionally we may not know who we are um, as an aged person we may not know who we are when it comes to uh, let's say um, our financial uh, based on our wealth what what kind of a person and wealth wealth we should have so like like that we we have different contexts in which our identity plays a role in some contexts we are seekers where we don't know who we are but uh, what we stand for but we are kind of open and stuff like that um in some contexts we are merely introspectors for example we know finance is important for our uh, life and we have had it we know probably like these um, uh, cosmetics and and beauty products are important for our life and we kind of have it but we are just introspecting whether we need it what do we need we could be in that space some of us are pleasers we do things just because we want to please the group that we want to be a part of um, and some of them are genuinely aware um, understand this when you are also when later when we are going to look into solutions that work um there will come a point where you need to be able to at least box your customers at least a persona a set of customers into one of these so that your communication marketing or anything can be um uh, more targeted to them because this forms their identity in some way um i i just made this example to share with you what are the different ways context influences decision making a very good example is if someone is let's say needing help on the road uh, they are like either falling down or they met with an accident many of us actually very few of us go and help and many of us actually just stand okay this is what is called pluralistic ignorance um, which is when when there is a situation where we are facing uncertainty and the information is ambiguous we look for others around us and see what they are doing and what we think is that this is what is written here right and what we think is oh like they they are not going and helping let me also not go help because the uncertainty you are facing is should i help or should i not help at the same time if you look at your self internally your internal context is saying i feel responsible i want to help but i don't know whether i have to help that's the uncertainty you are facing right you feel the responsibility that i want to increase my wealth but i don't know whether i have to invest in this or i have to renew this right that's the ambiguity that they are facing then 
uh, in those cases they look at in those cases social proof works right look at what others like you are doing that's where identity is also important others like you in this case of someone needing help others like you are people who are in that location or others like you right what others like you are doing that's an example of how context internal and external influences your behavior in fact you actually see the same um, uh, same reason why uh, many people are not let's say throwing the garbage or uh, many people like oh this is overwhelming i don't want to do this now or they they look at what others are doing in the society and based on that they kind of uh, take a decision okay this is again an error in judgment like we discussed um i want to also just touch up on a few other errors in judgment um that we make uh, that is very apt for you to understand your customers right uh, for example it's in the way that are uh, that we are um, built in our brain and everything we kind of overestimate our own ability i can do without this investment or someone had mentioned i can i can if i get i got this project for two weeks i can finish this project in two weeks not a big deal we overestimate that's our relationship with time right how do we correct that and that something that we don't learn is that have a reference point if you had a past similar experience okay in that experience how much time did i take okay let me kind of consider a, these are all looking very similar like is the same type of project it's the same type of deliverables then i will kind of like uh, okay that took 10 days i will probably take here also 10 to 12 days right have a reference point like that that's how your brain also learns so we kind of overestimate our own ability most of your customers are overestimating their own ability all of us we are all self protective your customers are self protective we are law servers especially when it comes to payment i've mentioned this to before willingness to pay always is because your law servers the willingness to pay is not there is because they are law servers they see this as a loss and that's largely because we think in the short term in the short term it may be a loss but in the long term it's beneficial but our brain finds it difficult to think long term i'll i'm telling you all of this but later i'll also tell you solutions to each of this then you will understand how that uh, error in the brain can be addressed and intervened with okay similarly we want to take least effort someone had mentioned that um, how how people uh, give you a project and about their business they have high goals but then they don't sit down with us for the brief give us good details be part of it that's because i delegate and that's it my job is done because that's the least effort that they want they want the job to get done with least effort because they have n number of other things happening they are getting overwhelmed right and this happens in a lot of cases even in wrong side driving most of us do most people do wrong side driving because it's it, it's it's too effortful to take that u turn blah 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 and and reach a point rather this is more easier even though if it is riskier similarly we have especially this is most uh, i i add this only because of the current age which is we have low self regulation and attention because there are too many things grabbing attention too many things that are attractive around us all always available always present this is the larger context in which your products are also there for the people for your customers so in this larger context that has too many high frictions let's look at a few things okay where what time are we in we are 11:33 okay we have just half an hour in okay um let's look at few things that will work okay now that that are working in different contexts i think i would now be able to finish it in another 20 minutes or something and i'm going to leave the floor for a lot of discussions because the more questions you ask the more answers i make that's how we kind of learn about human behaviors okay so what is working now we saw about how if if there is a need for help people are not going there is pluralistic ignorance uh, and people are having this co contradiction between i want to feel responsible but at the same time i don't know whether i can do this right calling out and co opting asking them to cooperate with this works even in monkeys and bonobos and everything if you point and you call them or um, ask them to do something we naturally have a tendency to cooperate with that okay so in your communication with your customers or when you're talking in close in person with your customers call them out hi shri or uh, hi ruchi hey can you do this for me do you want to try this once right you're making them cooperate by personalizing and calling them out and that works um and then 
uh, another thing is, this is in, very very interesting is like how i said 90 percentage of our um uh, of our decision making is uh, is non conscious right so we did this project for mankind pharma we were looking at consumer insights and uh, we were also looking at how the consumers uh, saw other um, pharmaceuticals other competitors in their different fields and this insight came out very interestingly of Dr. Reddy's, okay? People did not know Mankind Pharma as much as they did not know Dr. Reddy's, but they had some familiarity about Dr. Reddy's only because they were they saw these kind of hoardings on the bus stops about Dr. Reddy's. They saw uh, something on the auto. They saw it in the ads. They saw it like everywhere. It just shows. They didn't even know they needed Dr. Reddy's. Okay, Dr. Reddy's and Mankind Pharma has over-the-counter drugs that is not just doctor prescribed. So you can go and make a choice to buy it uh, from the pharmaceutical. And they ended up choosing Dr. Reddy's and they didn't even know they needed it because it was there in their environment. The, the mere exposure built familiarity and so trust and ruchi keeps saying this and i keep asking this question i don't know why networking works i don't know why um why if you keep showing yourself up and then uh, talking about your business works that's because ruchi always answers that it builds trust and that it builds trust one step before building trust is because mere exposure i see you everywhere around me which means and if you're likable, agreeable, all of that, right? Which is you're aligned with my personality, whatever. It, it communicates with me. I see you everywhere and it builds familiarity and that familiarity builds trust. Sometimes all your product needs is familiarity, especially in financial products. All your product needs is for the person to be familiar with the action of renewing the insurance, familiar with the action of what the insurance does. Most financial products, the, uh, even in the projects that we have done, like we did a pan India um, in investor study, uh, and we were also looking into like insurance and annuity uh, uh, renewals and stuff like that. And one common theme that kept coming out was cognitive overload. There is just too many information about finance, which I don't even understand. I don't even know how, and they tag everything as finance, right? It's ambiguous and it's uncertain. Finance is ambiguous and uncertain, and they look out for their past experiences, what their family did, what their friends are doing. They look out for what people are doing around it, right? There are two options always works in this. One, social proof. Um, uh, at, at any decision-making point, if you tell them that, hey, or 80% of people like you, or 80% of 40-year-olds uh, have chosen us, which you're being more specific about who's people like you. Right now, they are looking for a people like them to see whether I can take up this product or not. And you're telling them, yes, people like you are taking up that product. It's more likely that they will convert. Similarly, simple mere exposure. You keep showing them that simple information in their context. It means that it could also mean that you might have to make multiple calls to them, have frequent calls with different engaging conversations with them. They're getting familiarized with the financial jargons, with the financial decision-making process, how to decide on a product, whether to renew it or not. That mere exposure will build familiarity and that familiarity has a tendency to build trust and conducive decision-making. Why I put this uh, New York um, uh, thing is also because in most uh, big brands, this keeps coming up how they kind of, these are called urban screens, how, and, and in London has something called Piccadilly Circus where it has urban screens like this, and they all, um, you know, like go out and all to be on one of those urban screens because this is mere exposure at its best, right? Everyone congregates in these squares and spaces, public spaces, and all you see is all these ads. And all you have to do is just make the customer get exposed to these things. They, they don't even have to pay attention what it is. It will just non-consciously grab something and they will, over a period of time, it becomes familiar, right? That's the power of mere exposure effect and, and it's worked in some of my projects as well. Some other thing, again, uh, a very, um, very, very uh, important for the financial products kind of uh, be, customer base is image-based communication, especially when the communication is complex. Like people don't understand, this is from one of my projects, people don't understand what a quality uh, for many urban people, the source of water is tap. No, the source of water is either a lake or in some in very in rural places, it's a river. The source of water is there. So people don't understand the water connection system, how your actions with the water kind of 
uh, works uh, in its quality and everything, right? They're, they, they're all invisible processes. They don't understand. So all you have to do is make it visible through images. Uh, your brain processes image-based communication much more faster than written communication in any context. So image-based communications or infographic communications work. So if you have flyers that you want to talk with your beyond your marketing, even when you're talking in person with your clients, um, if you have flyers that's infographic, just simple information, it works, right? It At least they can process and they are a little bit more aware. Um, another uh, line of um, this is something that happens in, uh, you know, people talk, you, many of, some of you have mentioned about, hey, there is a link I'm sending, people are not clicking the link. Um, so I had this project with, <clears throat> with a NGO, which uses chatbot uh, to communicate with the citizens in Bangalore and increase their uh, civic participation. You see a garbage, you have to do something, right? Hey, your road is not good, you have to do something. And what we found was, in fact, link-based um, link based messages almost uh, rarely gets clicked. What gets clicked is a button. So we changed all our communications to button and, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the engagement obviously got more than double. Okay, so uh, things like that, right? Because the button is least effort. We know we are all least effort. It's simple in communication rather than a link because we also think the old link is now going to go into another another uh, Chrome. All that quick uh, processing has happened. So we kind of tend to not click on link. We leave it for a later time and that later never happens. Similarly, there are other ways we can uh, come. I don't know whether I had a picture here. We, there are other ways we can uh, communicate uh, with with your information itself, um, how you communicate, right? Like the words that you are using. This is again something that we tested in the chat bot. First uh, is personalization. Almost everyone said that it feels like it feels like someone is sitting beside me and talking, right? Many of us use Zoom or in-person conversations for our products or newsletters we use, which is digital and all of that. As much as possible, try to personalize your communication to them. Uh, your personalization could be in the name of uh, name. Your personalization could also be in the name of, let's say if they are, if they are a tribe of, uh, let's say waste watchers or waste warriors, or your personalization is by saying, hey, waste warrior, right? So that bringing in that community spirit, identity spirit uh, works in every communication. If you can bring that, it works. Like I said, identity centric language. Why I'm bringing this up again is um, we uh, try maybe maybe it's time that we change our process of approach to dealing with customers and take some time to understand your customer. Where are their motives? Why are they coming to your service or your product? And you don't have to do it individually, but at least try to look at it from a pattern perspective, right? Okay, people living in Bangalore or women of 40 years of age, you, whatever segmentation works for your thing, but find their identity and, and communicate to them in their identity centric language. That's when they're, they put their attention for their taking an action towards your, buying your product or anything. That's when you're grabbing their attention. Then comes your language should be easy to understand. It should be emotionally hooking um, and make it relevant as much as possible. These are not something new I'm telling you, but this is a structure that we followed for many of the communication interventions that we did. And the structure has garnered like over 50% engagement rate, right? And another thing that often we miss out on is timely communication. Um, sometimes, it, you do, it's very difficult to understand at what stage the customer is in to say that, um, is this the right time or not? Like, like I'll take an example of Hen. Um, there are many of us who are engaging with Hen. It's more like, it's also likely that, that many of the Hen members who have paid are also not uh, engaging, right? There are, uh, there every, every app, every service will have a, people who are active engagers, medium engagers and inactive. Right now, you need to give them timely communication. Let's say that let's assume that inactive or medium active members, it's not intentionally doing. They are just overwhelmed in their, in their day, and uh, they have not put in their routine to work with your uh, service. Right. So find when is the right time to timely communicate to them. Right. Uh, either within their day or a timely communication could also be if they know. Okay, these guys are all all of them are business owners. They are all going to go through budget. Um, 
maybe should i now now maybe march is the right time for me to communicate to them consistently let's say every week you are sending them a newsletter or a message reminding them about an event that's timely messaging and we all miss out on identity and timely communication and that keeps coming up at least in my projects that that's one of the main reasons where why engagement with especially tech services don't happen um other attention grabbing designs are working uh, of course but there are ethical issues like for example we see this in travel spaces this is called default uh, effect where if some we are as humans we want to make take least effort right like i mentioned those grounding uh, behavior behavioral um, uh, criteria so this is a default thing so by default they'll put yes i want uh, insurance or uh, travel insurance and many people actually fall for this and they kind of pay for the travel insurance as well right so depending on what context you are using this default what context you are making i decline very very uh, not attractive um has ethical boundaries that you have to kind of find for yourself again this is identity based communication if you're fat go here you don't want to be uh, called uh, less like i'm fat but then that does not mean that i'm not taking efforts towards reducing right that's identity based simple image based communication um these are all like emotional hooks this is something that we had we had uh, my ex company had done um with at the wadala station in um, bombay and it kind of, it kind of reduced accidents uh by 0% right like it reduced accidents to 0% uh what all they did was the people were crossing as the train were coming right and where, where what is happening here is overconfidence that i can cross before the train can come uh, but we don't know how to judge the speed and everything so all they did was wherever there is heavy crossing they had put it right in front of them emotionally hooking and it's right in front of you right it's very timely it's it's perfectly positioned that way it reduced the accidents in 6 months it reduced the accidents by um 0% it this this is an example that is not directly linked to the kind of uh, customers and consumers that you are working with but what i want you to identify here with is the design principle right which is putting some an emotional hook at the right time or at the right place within your app or within your flyer or in your website you know things like that work this is also something that we had done where we wanted people to hand wash for 20 seconds um and we had put a play based thing in bathrooms uh, i just put it there but i feel as i'm saying this it's not super relevant again um this is another one you all might have come across this where uh that mere exposure effect right so maybe like if you are having some kind of information material that you are sharing if that information material has some human face or if it has some other thing that they are familiar with it builds trust these are all small uh, small things uh, similarly within this communication uh, styles itself uh, another thing that keeps coming up which is which is in so the the your customers are all in a space where they are um, they are having a lot of information in a day they are going through a lot of decision making in but if they are at least for the people who have already paid and say joined your service for example uh, they have created a commitment but they have just not been consistent with their commitment right all they need in this is some other push in their external context Uh, for example hey i have committed for my exercise regimen but i am not able to do it regularly then you just attend a short challenge this is just a 21 day challenge you should do yoga for 21 days you just do that you feel good and you're act your with your with your uh, with your service right so similarly variable rewards are things where the your customer is not expecting a reward from you but something of the of what they did or something of what you did and you reached an achievement and you're just sharing that achievement with them those things are seeding motivation within their context that will make them come back to your product and stuff like that that is i mean again variable rewards are not something that everyone needs it's not necessary external motivations are not always necessary but they are like that mere exposure right uh, they are something that it kind of non consciously just feel feel makes you feel good so your body and your brain remembers that hey i had this feel good experience with this uh, thing i can either refer them 
or uh, I can probably buy from them, right? So the short challenges and variable rewards are like that. You don't always need them, but if you once in a while provide them, they do add value. Okay. Uh, some of them, many of you have uh, uh, spoken about the willingness to, where is the play button? Uh, willing, the willingness to pay, but they are not paying after a certain while. And this is coming out product of a product, finance or cosmetic, anything, even in our, our own financial products. We saw that, when it's an individual product, people feel loss aversion. It's a lot for this, right? But when it's bundled, people think that it's a perception, right? Like I said, it's an emotion. We are emotional decision makers rather than logical decision makers. It's not about where we are, where we are making a profitable decision. It's more about what I feel emotionally comfortable with. And in this case, a bundled product set gives a perception that, okay, I'm getting more more out of this extra little that I'm paying, right? And this coming again and again, that's one of the best uh, spaces where willingness to pay has been improved. There's something for the products to try. Um, finally, finally, guys, uh, is a, I want you all to understand uh, habit, how habit works, because um, each of this decision making, either engaging with the community or engaging with the product or going with a nutritionist and, and like, you know, going by their regimen is all is trying to fit that decision within your everyday schedule. We all overestimate time. Our relationship with time is not the best. Uh, uh, so, but our intent might be there, right? So we just need some support systems to get that habit on track. So uh, for that, there is a lot of research that has been done on habit itself. Sorry. So I'm going to just run you through um, this. Let me know. Hear the, uh, hear the thing, okay? Can you all hear? The music is not there. Music is not there. Whether you realize it or not. Most, now it's come. Now it's come. Actually have it. And what you might mistake as decision making is almost always a strong habit that you've learned over the years. If you want the power to change your habits, you must understand how the habit loop works. The basic loop consists of a cue, routine, and a reward. Almost every activity that you carry out on a daily basis falls into the basic habit loop. Until you fully understand how the habit loop works, you'll find it nearly impossible to eliminate unwanted behaviors from your life. Instead of relying on nothing but willpower alone, which is finite, you can re-engineer your habit loop take control of your life. Let's look at Bob. Every day, Bob gets up at six o'clock in the morning. He rolls out of bed, takes a shower, eats breakfast, and goes to work. After working an eight-hour shift, Bob comes home, hangs up his coat, and walks into the kitchen. Next, he plops out onto the couch and turns on the television. After about 30 minutes, a commercial comes on and advertises the latest flavor of ice cream. Bob springs up from the couch as if he's been lifted by some unknown force, and he grabs his car keys off the kitchen counter. Within minutes, he's at the grocery store, grabbing the new flavor of ice cream that he saw advertised on the television. However, after grabbing the ice cream, Bob ends up with a basket full of candy, TV dinners, potato chips, and about 15 other products that are full of empty calories and promises. Bob has just entered and completed a habit loop without even realizing the cue was the advertisement on television for the new flavor of ice cream. And without him even realizing it, Bob started to carry out the routine, which consists of going to the grocery store and getting the new flavor of ice cream. Now, Bob had no idea that part of the routine for this habit would consist of grabbing an entire basket full of crappy products. Once Bob gets home, he eats half of the items in the basket and completes the reward portion of the habit. To this day, Bob has no idea why all of his dieting and exercise habits have failed. And he is still just over 300 pounds. It's not that Bob doesn't want to lose weight. He just doesn't understand how his habits are impacting his life. Remember, all habit loops consist of a cue, routine, and reward. The cue is what initiates the loop. The routine is carried out after the cue on autopilot. And the reward is what you get for carrying out the behavior or routine. At the heart of every habit loop is a craving. You can think of cravings like fuel for your habit. In Bob's case, the craving was for sweet, fatty foods, and the reward was the pleasure of consuming such foods. It's important to understand that habit loops can never be forgotten. They can only be changed. In other words, 
bad habits can be replaced with new, more productive ones. Once a strong habit has been formed, your brain will begin to anticipate the reward before it's even given, and distractions will start to lose the power of people. So, I just want to stop there because it's a long other set of video that's not like necessary at this moment. Uh, what I do want you to understand is that um, habit has this loop of routine, cue, routine, and reward, right? Let's take the example of the nutritionist person who had come. Uh, usually, it, it, it's very... Uh, it, so what people are doing is, let's say that there is, the cue could be is just your own cultural learning, right? Okay, I have to cook food, I do. And then like, uh, I have X amount of... Uh, recipes and then I make those food and then it's rewarding, it's familiar, the food is familiar and then I eat and stuff like that. You want to change that routine where they are changing their ingredients. There are multiple ways that we can go about this, right? The routine has to change, which means they should also find the change routine rewarding. Most of the time, the reward that your customer wants is linked to their identity. You have to understand about identity. There is an identity that they hold and the identity that they desire. The craving almost always is the identity they desire. I want to be part of a community. Say that I am a part of this community, the identity someone desires. I want to be fit. I want my health to be a certain way is an identity that they desire. Most of their time, their craving and reward is linked to their identity. So your cue should be linked to their identity in some way, right? So, um, so in this case, uh, in the case of the nutritionist, they need to change their routine. The cue could be a reminder, right? Every day morning, I'm going to send you a reminder. Let's say oh, for like one month, every day morning at 7 a.m., you're sending them a reminder of this is the ingredients that you can use and this you cannot. Very good communication. You've personalized it. It is in a good infographic visually there. Now, first two weeks, they may not change. But because you are sending them a reminder consistently that mere exposure is happening, so automatically at some point, they will start anticipating that cue. And since their identity is still intact, which is I want to feel the reward of eating good food, that cue at some point will translate to routine. Now, what, what point, whether it's three weeks, 20 days, is a research that's very individualistic. Depends on the personality, depends on how committed they are, depends on whether they are able to do that within their day and, and, and you know, stuff like that, right? So this Q routine reward, habit we know as a, habit is, so ha routine is the precursor to, okay, routine is a precursor to habit. Habit is when an action becomes extremely non-conscious. Until then, it's just about following that routine day after day or month after month or, you know, year after year. So from that angle, the mere act of even um, even renewing uh, any of your financial products or renewing any of your subscriptions is also a routine. Okay, so the queue is and so uh, what from whatever I understand, the queue is um, is never one time queue. Always mix it with mere exposures. Give multiple cues if it is linked to their identity, and your cue should be linked to their identity. So it's important that you consistently understand your customers. So if it is linked to their identity, then it makes it relevant and you keep reminding them or giving them giving them cues as to why they should do this, why they should not do it. Automatically, that routine can happen and either the reward will be immediate or later, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so I will kind of take questions on habit a little later. Uh, I'm kind of towards the end of the end of the session, right? So I just want to quickly recap. There are three things we learned. Brain is the few things we learned. These are the three main things. One is brain is the control center. Context influences our decision making, internal and external. Emotions drive our decision making. Logic is secondary to us. In fact, we become more logic. The more self-aware we are, really aware, not the other quadrants. If the more self-aware we are, the more logical can be our decision making. And we do make errors in judgments. So it's, it's within our capacity to understand why your customer is making error in judgment and, you know, like uh, kind of, you know, intervening for that error in some manner, either through social proof or uh, either through mere exposure effect or either through like uh, telling them how about their rewards, linking it to their identity. You know, there are many, many ways. 
In fact, the more and more projects I do, I feel like the context and the self and identity are the bookends for any intervention we end up uh, doing. Um, I just want to finally uh, kind of just show you this. This is how, th this is a new, new neuron trying to make connection with existing neurons, right? And that's what our brain does every day. With new, new information that you're receiving today, your brain is going through this process. I've got this new information and making sense of it here, right? So every product, if, whether finance or this or that, it may be new to your customer, but it's just about making it relevant for them, linked to their identity and the neural connections will happen. Uh, it just has to be done in a certain way. Um, I want to touch upon just the last bit. Who are we to intervene? How can we as people, as behavior change agents actually intervene, right? There are ethics of it, but there are three principles that you can you can generally like follow. One is your design principle, which is um, where do you position? How to communicate? Like even copywriting is designed by in a way, right? It's creative. Uh, it's creative in its own way. So, how, where are you positioning your content? What kind of person are you showing in percentages? Are you showing in like you know relative? Like one in six people take up. Uh, one in six people continue even after one week of subscription, right? Uh, one in six people uh, start having start let's say uh, facilitating sessions after six months of being part of the community, right? That's all showing social proof. How you show the social proof? whether with images or not, whether you're placing it in front of them, whether you're placing it in the corner of your screen, things like that, right? They're all design principles. Um, there are many design principles here, which we are not getting into now. Um, maybe like uh, once I finish this, you could also like think about reflect on, verbally reflect, openly reflect on what kind of design principles you found in the various examples that we just discussed. The second thing that you have to keep in mind while you're intervening for behaviors is you need to understand yourself and the other, right? Which is, we all have instincts. We are all animals. We all have instincts, okay? And emotions are primary. In animals, we see fear as an emotion, greed as an emotion, right? Um, uh, like that happiness is also there. There are like basic emotions. We also have that. We also have an extra layer of, em uh, many layers of emotions. In fact, there are many, many, many sub-layers of emotions that we have and they all inform our intuition. Okay, in this moment, this messaging is right or this, this product is right for me. Uh, I don't want this product. It's all you're making you an intuitive choice. But when you provide logic and reason as well, it helps regulate that emotion. Let's say that I'm fearful of financial products. Okay, and but then... If you, if I see that my friend is investing and they are doing good, um, if I if I keep seeing this that no no it's trustworthy and this is good this is good I'm getting more new information which is helping which is logical and if I kind of process that information it's kind of improving regulating my emotion right okay I don't have to be fearful here I just have to be fearful here so I don't have to make like just completely emotion driven decision making I can put in some logic right so over a period of time. Emotions and logic both kind of influence your intuition and you should just understand that for yourself also. As, as business owners, sometimes we get desperate with certain needs, but we need to be able to pause ourselves and find logic and trust our intuition, right? So that's another thing we have to consider, especially when it comes to ethics of how we are marketing or intervening uh, for behavior change. Um, final thing is, empathy it's just a simple four five step process right about your uh, about your customer let's say that you're saying your customer is rude uh your your customer is just i'm just so fed up that you know they just don't engage like how much can i do right take a moment suspend your judgment how much can i do your customer is rude any assessment you're making about your customer is a judgment right it could be a bias it could it could be an error in judgment it could be a true judgment that doesn't matter stop suspend your judgment Okay, uh, just just take and breathe, reset your external context, write, articulate what they are feeling. If you have to write it down, right? In their, if they were to say what they are feeling, hey, uh, uh, let's take the example of being rude, right? If I were to write why a customer is rude, is rude, they are dealing with their external context is such that the customer care services have probably not ever been good to them or something like that. They've never had good experiences with customer or they have a certain, um, certain what do I say, judgment about what the customer executives could be or should be. 
And so their responses to any kind of customer care services have always been very. Let's say that this is my understanding of that, right? Now, I'm going to say that given the context that the customer has experienced not so bad, good experiences with uh, services, given the fact that their problems are not getting addressed through these customer services, given the fact that there are so many customer services, they are getting bombarded with calls or messages and all of that, they have developed a certain kind of response to any customer call. In this context, whatever they are whatever they are experiencing and responding with is absolutely valid. That's your fourth step, right? I'm saying it's absolutely valid. They are not wrong. And now we have to find ways either you can seek them, you can find learn more about their, your customer, find their identity and see other ways that you can respond with them. We discuss how you can how you can intervene with them, right? Now seek in another way. Don't don't ever create behavioral interventions from a point of judgment about your customers or assumptions about your customers, it may not work. So those are the three. And finally is evidence. There is a lot. This is the first time in human history. The reason even my role exists as a behavioral science a practitioner is because the first time in human history, we have so much knowledge around how human mind works, how decision making works, why people behave the way we behave. There's a lot of evidence, particularly around communication and emotion, what works, what doesn't work, why I'm not giving a, a pattern, oh, this will work. I can't say that this will work in your context because it's very, very context specific. In your product, bundling could work for some other product, bundling may not work, but it's more likely that a bundling would work because of the way that we are all, uh, you know, wired. So look at, look for evidence, read about it a little bit and uh, go about it. So basically just three things you should keep, design principles, where you're placing, how you're placing, when you're placing your interventions and stuff like that. And be empathetic with your customer always, even if you're frustrated, just choose empathy as your, the five-step empathy as your uh, default uh, you know, option. It's very, very calming also if you start practicing it. And the third step, look out for evidence. That's kind of my end of it. <laughs>